To begin with, I'm, I'd like to start with a, a living land acknowledgement. And I'd like to just share that we're starting this really important event by acknowledging that the city of Guelph, where the Two Rivers Festival takes place, is situated on the stolen, unceded land within the Dish With One Spoon territory, stewarded for many, many, many generations by the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat peoples. This covenant bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Many of these peoples were displaced because of greed and racism, the hallmarks of capitalism and white supremacy, which was the motivation behind settler colonialism. We acknowledge that this so that we can bring our whole full-hearted consciousness to the truth of how and why we came to be here today so that we may be inspired and motivated to action. We know that observation of an injustice comes with an obligation to act and we acknowledge the ugly truths so we can give birth by our actions to beauty and justice and liberation. The Two Rivers Festival strives to connect the Guelph community with the city's two beautiful rivers, the Speed and the Aramosa. This year, our theme for the festival is reaching the river's edge. This theme encompasses an invitation to all community members to bring their stories and share together on the shores of these rivers which is the pulsing vein of life through this landscape. In the past, the Two Rivers Festival has focused predominantly on local ecology. As our collective awareness grows, so too grows the understanding of the need to learn more about the myriad intersectional issues that compound and exacerbate ecological problems whose stories have not been told. This year's theme also invites us to consider the ways in which we are in reciprocity with this local source, this water, this source of life for all of us. As the speed and Aramasa in their beauty and generosity call us to engage, we too can reach toward her and ask the question, how, what, how might we be in service? The river's edge is a liminal space between water and land as we can reconsider and reimagine the ways in which the Two Rivers Festival can be effective in increasing the overall health of this part of the watershed, this liminal space feels appropriate in the theme reaching the river's edge. This can be envisioned as a welcoming point on our journey to stop, reflect, and feel sustained, but also acknowledge that our journey is still continuing on, as is our learning. So my name is Arlene and I am the Two Rivers Festival Marshal uh, facilitating this event. Welcome to the Protect the Track panel discussion and documentary screening. We'd like to extend our sincere thanks to Serena, Layla, Courtney and Skylar for joining us today, taking time out of their busy lives and sharing their passion for the sovereignty of their nation in relationship with these lands and rivers. I also wanna extend a thanks to all of you for taking time to join this really important conversation. This festival is organized and run by volunteers and involves many community organizations. Please support these organizations that are doing good work in and around our community. You'll also note on our website that there are several sponsors who made uh, the festival possible. Please have a look to, to see who they are and support those where possible too. This festival is a project of the Water Watchers and it is our hope that if we celebrate and fall in love with our rivers, we will want to further protect them. So now I'm going to pass it over to Serena to introduce herself and the event. Thanks, Serena. I'm Kiva Wolf Clan from Six Nations, and I'm also Panamanian from down south. Um, <clears throat> I have been working with Protect the Track as the youth lead uh, for about a while now, and um, I'm just a passionate Haudenosaunee youth who is really inspired by the land defenders in my community who have taken the land back. Um, and that's why I'm here today to continue doing that work and put my skills where they're needed. So I'm currently a master's student in geography and environment at Western University. I focus my research on um, does self-determination and autonomy improve our health and well-being as Indigenous nations, which I think really resonates with the conversation today and land back altogether. Um, so without further ado, today we're going to have a blood and water screening documentary by the lovely Layla Stotts, and then we will follow up with um, Layla Stotts, Skylar Williams, and Courtney Skye as a panel to further talk about the themes within the documentary and land back, protect the track, 
water protection, all the good stuff. And so without further ado, I'm going to allow Layla to introduce herself and to introduce this documentary and we will watch the screening. Thank you, Nyawa Goa, for everyone being here. Nyawa, thank you so much, Serena. Can you guys hear me, see me? Am I coming in clear? All right, good. Sego, uh, skeno, Leila Stats Young Yats, Anawara, Niwagita Roden, Ganyak, Gehaga, Niwago, Wenjodan, Oswego, Nidawagano. Hello, my name is Leila Stats. I'm Mohawk Turtle Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River and the filmmaker of the film you're about to watch. This film, uh, I made it actually two years ago as a healing statement for myself. Uh, there's this strength, there's this power when we speak our truths, when we tell our stories, when we say them out loud. Uh, and I honestly didn't think that, you know, it was, anyone was gonna watch it. <laughs> it was, and I thought, you know, even if no one watches it, I just wanna say the, these, these, uh, I wanna say these things out loud and put them out there. But as I started to screen it, uh, I realized that the story of reclamation and taking back our, our culture and identity and our, our connection, uh, all of the things that had been taken from us during residential schools, this is not just my story. Um, and there are many of us that have been dispossessed of our lands, dispossessed of our language, uh, of our culture and our identity. And so I realized that, you know, a lot of people actually resonated with the film and it, uh, it gives you an understanding of how these generational traumas, um, this, this, the impacts of, of colonization, you know, over the last 150 years have uh, incremental impact still to this day on, you know, the next generation and the next generation. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to uh, be aware of that. So I'm looking forward to coming back afterwards for discussion. If there's any questions or anything that stands out to you, any any stories or or, or anything that you want to share uh, after watching the film, you know, I think that that's one of the most important parts of these film screenings is taking in the story, but then also using your voice to, uh, you know, share your own and make it your own. And, and what did you take from it? What did you learn from it? So that we can uh, we can move forward. So I'll get myself out of the way. I don't, I'm not sure who's techie and pressing play here, uh, but we're good to go. <laughs> Ahodan Garibadegua, the words before all else. I was told by people in the filmmaking industry that I shouldn't start the documentary with the Thanksgiving address. It can take up to 20 minutes to thank all elements of creation. And it's all in Mohawk, so you can't understand any of it. Most people don't speak Mohawk. I was told you'll lose them. They won't watch it. And for me, that was exactly why we had to start this film with the Ahoda Garibadegua. I remember the first time I heard the Thanksgiving address, I had no idea what they were saying. I was at a conference sitting there, an elder walked to the front of the room and started speaking. And even though I couldn't understand it, I knew it was significant. I knew it was important. I felt it in my bones, in my blood. But when I looked around, I saw people on their phones, checking out, getting bored and impatient. And it became very clear to me that this is part of the problem in our society. We're in this microwave society where we want everything now. We want it so bad that we can't even take the time to acknowledge the gratitude and the thankfulness for the things that we have that keep us alive. So as you listen to the Ahoda Geriwadegua, I really want you to, even though you don't understand what they're saying, I really want you to connect with the feeling of gratitude and giving that thanks for all of these things 
and listening with a good mind. Ndaye tina wada adu na ungwai suwa. Ito gari na yo tuhage na yungwa ni gula. Ndaye tina wada adu na yeti nistaha johon jade. Ito gari na yo tuhage na yungwa ni gula. Ndaye tina wada adu na gahne ga suwa. Ito gari na yo tuhage na yungwa ni gula. Ndaye tina wada adu na gunjo suwa. ตาเอตโตนายตัวแกนันกวาดนิโกระตาเอตโตนายตัวแกนันกวาดนิโกระตาเอตโตนายตัวแกนันกวาดนิโกระตาเอตโตนายตัวแกนันกวาดนิโก
Gord Stotts, the son of Ernest and Susan Stotts, the grandson of Christine Stotts. My middle name is Christine, after her. Christine was a student at the Mohawk Institute Residential School. I never knew her, but I feel like I still carry her with me. And one of the things I definitely feel is the trauma. I remember stories of her being passed down, of her escaping from the windows and scaling the walls just to get away. Instead of passing down a gift of culture and language and this beautiful tradition to her children and her grandchildren, like the Creator intended, she passed down a coat of shame. She literally had the Indian beat out of her, and that trauma trickled down through our family. The love that one gets from a parent Christy never had, never learned how to experience, how to share it. Imagine that as a child, never feeling love, never experiencing love. And that pattern continues through generations. My puppet's childhood was cold and hard. Because of that residential school, he didn't know his language. He didn't know his culture. He didn't know anything that I'm about to share with you here in this video. And I always saw him as kind of afraid of it. He would tell us not to use our last name on our resume because we wouldn't get the job. He would tell us not to tell people that we were native, not to go to the reserve because it was dangerous. He cast that code of shame down to us, his grandchildren. We were Mohawk Turtle Clan, but that was all we knew. And we didn't even know what that meant. And like a lot of families, dealing with this intergenerational trauma, alcoholism, Violence, depression, trauma sprinkled throughout my family. It spread like a, a virus you couldn't get rid of. And only when my brother and sister and I started to learn our Haudenosaunee culture did we start to recognize this dark spot that had been living inside of us. And as I started to learn about the history of my family, the history of what happened to hundreds of thousands of these indigenous children, what happened to Christine? I started to understand those feelings of not belonging. I started to understand that pain and anger I was carrying around. And I really started to get it. And thus started my healing journey. My papa may have never taught me the Ahodan Garibadegua. He didn't show me the ceremonies. He didn't show me the history of the Ganyakehaga. But one thing he did teach me was the relationship and responsibility that I had to water. As I look back now, I see residential schools, they may have cut their hair off. They may have taken their names and give them numbers, taken their language. But even through that coat of shame, my papa felt the water. It was alive to him. It was alive inside of him. And he passed that on to me. Nyawagoa, Gord. Every morning he'd wake up at dawn and he would walk this land. He dug these ponds on this land so that future generations of his family would always have access to water. He spoke at conferences in our nation's capital about how these ponds could help indigenous communities that didn't have access to water. He dug ponds for other people in the community. Water is in our blood. And I come to these spots to see through all of that trauma that was passed down to me and heal with the water. We all have different connections with the water. Different, yet the same. To me, the water is almost like a physical manifestation of spirit. You can see spirit flowing down beside you. For me, whenever I'm feeling you know, down or lost, or I just have a question. I just go and I sit by the water and I just listen. And it all comes and it all just feels right. I grew up on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And when I left, I remember dreaming about it. And I still dream about it decades later because the water that I grew up around was also in my blood. Water is what makes up most of your body. So it's outside of you and it's alive and well, just like your body is. So you can literally see the spirit in the water as it's flowing. The Grand River has been an integral part of the Haudenosaunee life. 
The city of Branford and surrounding areas is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Attawatam people. And the work we do, the activism, the learning, it will never be complete unless we acknowledge and remind ourselves and others that colonization is not just a thing of the past. We must acknowledge Settlers have access to this land because of colonial violence. The Haldeman Treaty guaranteed the exclusive use of 950,000 acres, six miles along each side of the Grand River, to the Haudenosaunee people, to the members of Six Nations. To this day, through the process of colonialism, racism, genocide, settlers have secured 902,000 acres, leaving 48,000 acres for Six Nations. So we have to acknowledge the resilience of these Six Nations communities that have lived, loved, and resisted here forever. We acknowledge the resilience of this land. We acknowledge our role in decolonizing the mindset of the land we all call home now. And after all these broken treaties and stolen lands, still more than 50% of homes on Six Nations are running without running water. But who has the rights to these waters? The Haudenosaunee speak in terms of responsibility, respect to the water, not in terms of water rights. The law of the land is not of police and government, but it's a higher law. The original instructions, Ahodan Gariwadegwa. The creator gave us this task as humans to recite the Thanksgiving address, which is a constant reminder of the early law of the land, to first give thanks. We believe that at one time all creatures, all living things, could communicate, talk to each other. Even the water. Today, the water's lost its ability, lost its voice. And it's the responsibility of the Haudenosaunee to uphold the voice of the water. It was passed down to us. So being the voice of the water, much different than owning it or having a right to it. What happens if we don't have enough water? What happens if we poison our water? What does our world look like? My papa may have never learned the traditional beliefs of his ancestors. He never learned the Thanksgiving address. He never went to Longhouse and he never spoke a single Mohawk word. He didn't really have you know, a connection to his culture, but without knowing it, you know, he was he was like one of the most indigenous men that I knew. The knowledge that he carried, how to create these ponds, how to create clean ecosystems and habitats for all our creatures out here. How to really, really, you know, cultivate the water and make it safe to drink. It's just so amazing to kind of watch him do these super indigenous things without really knowing who he was. He may have been ashamed and afraid of who he was because of colonization but it's not too late for us. It was those walks along the water's edge where I first remember truly feeling connected, connected to the bigger picture, connected to nature, connected to life and to Mother Earth. I remember understanding at a very early age, I had to take care of the water. And now I'm understanding that it's my responsibility to be the voice of the water, which is why I wanted to make this film. I wanted to share his story and other stories I get to sing with the water, to the water, for the water. Water is life. It holds energy and it's alive. One of the other lessons I learned as I started to reclaim my culture was the Turo Wampum. My name is Susie Miller. I am a teacher at Emily C. General Elementary School at Six Nations. Our ancestors knew how to live in relationship because they lived in relationship for thousands of years. So the Turo is the first treaty that was made outside of Indigenous nations from Turtle Island. One purple row represents the, the ship of those that came across the water. The other row represents the canoe, the canoe of our ancestors traveling the waters. What those two, row, two rows do is they travel parallel down the river of life, side by side, without interfering. In this row, in the ship, thinking and way of life tends to be linear. It's always progressing. In the canoe way of understanding, it's like a circle, it's a cycle, and everything is connected. This treaty, when it was made, um, it's, it's a promise 
And there was no end point because they said that as long as the grasses grow and the rivers flow, um, this treaty will be in existence and it still exists today. How we are to be living in relationship with each other. Residential schools may have taken our languages. They may have taken our culture and our access to knowledge and ancestral wisdom. They may have caused trauma and pain that is still being felt today. But through all that, they could not take away my papa's connection to the water. It was inside of him all along, just like it's inside of you. Thank you for spending this time with me and my papa and the water and my family. Water is life. Yonganalongwa onega. Onegawahi. Gunalongwa. This is for my bloodline, all my natives on the front line. Keep your money in your pipeline, cause nobody in the right mind. This is for my sisters, they were stolen and they're missing. And this is for my grandmother, and this is for your grandmother. Hit them with the water song up, G, yo. <laughs> so I like to actually play the, that, uh, that song because it's the only place in the world So I need a little water, so hit him with the water song, up oh, she yo. Let me hit my water bomb, up oh, she yo. Hit me with the water song, up oh, she go. All right. <laughs> I think we can cut it up now. <laughs> So say go, thank you everybody. Welcome back uh, after the film. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, so yeah, thank you for just, you know, I think that that's one of the most important things is sitting down and being open enough to receive someone else's story experiences. Um, you know, I've, I've had mixed reviews from, you know, people uh, with, you know, just having different experiences with that film, whether they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, uh, whether they grew up in a traditional uh, home in the Longhouse or grew up on the reserve or grew up in an urban, as an urban Indigenous youth. Uh, we've all had so many experiences, but there is this connection that we all have uh, and this beauty that happens when we take it back. Uh, and it's kind of like, I almost think of it like Dorothy and her ruby shoes, you know, like you're searching. I felt like I was searching for this indigenousness about me uh, and, uh, you know, always measuring and, you know, am I, am, I, am I native enough? But then at the end, you know, at home, when she's trying to go home, it was always within her. All she had to do was, you know, click her feet together and it had been there the whole time. There was nothing extra she had to do. It was within her. And that's the same journey that I feel I've been on uh, with the water. And so since that documentary, uh, you know, the water has become a driving force. Uh, I've developed a deep relationship with it where I feel like I, I feel like it speaks to me. I feel like I, I can hear it as I'm standing beside it. And I've had moments where, uh, you know, I just, uh, I've heard it calling to me saying, you know, like we need, 
protect me, help me, uh, save me. And, uh, you know, I feel like there's this urgency that we have now. And so it led me on, I'm actually working on a new project right now, uh, a new film that's coming out this January, uh, all about the boil water advisories. So I traveled to various First Nations communities all around, um, all around Turtle Island, from the Hopi uh, over to the Yurok in California, up northern Ontario, like way, way north, uh, Flying Community, and Wet'suwet'en. So uh, that film, you know, I, I feel like opened up even more doors, you know, it, it opened up an even, even deeper connection and also created that that real time urgency. Like I saw, I, I met the people that were struggling with boil water advisories for 25 years. I met the people that communities were disintegrating because of lack of clean water. Uh, I met people who cried real tears over, you know, the poisoning of their water beyond repair. Uh, and so when I, when I, when I created that film, it actually, it inspired me. I saw all this damaged water. I saw all the like, dead salmon. I saw uh, E. coli. I saw people getting cancer and dying. And then I, and then I saw what Sudan, which we'll talk about, uh, you know, I saw the Winziqua and here is this glacier fed, uh, pristine, untouched water that, you know, you, you put it to your mouth and you can feel that it's alive. You can feel it tingling in electricity, like lightning bolts going through you. Uh, and, you know, I thought here, here I've been on this journey seeing, you know, water that we've destroyed and we could do something to protect it. Uh, and so thus led the journey of, you know, standing on front lines uh, with, with many other indigenous and non-indigenous to defend the water and protect the water. Um, just like, you know, we're, we're here to do today. So, you know, and, and, and that's the thing is it doesn't have to happen on the front line. Uh, you know, our, our mission, our responsibility to the water, it comes from within us. And I, I like to think that once you, you learn something, you can't unlearn it. So what you're about to learn here today will open your eyes, will shape your perspective, will change how you see your relationship to water uh, and your responsibility to it. And then moving forward, you know, you take that knowledge and you operate from within that newfound knowledge uh, and we, we make change together. So thank you so much, guys. I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel though, Serena. Yeah, go Alayla. Like there were so many great themes, watching it again a second time and just like thinking about the connection to land, our health, our well-being as nations. And we'll get into that uh, further into the panel, but I want, one thing I want you to get from Layla's film, and, and she said this, is that this was completely intentional, like to sever these rela indigenous relationships to the land because they knew the power we had with that relationship. We were environmentally dispossessed from these lands so that we wouldn't have those connections, so that we couldn't be autonomous and we couldn't have um, our own governance systems. And so after watching that, like, I hope you think like, we want to take it all back, right? And I hope that's the kind of power you got out of her documentary today is that, when we take it back, we're taking everything back and we'll get into that. I'll let Layla go a little further after, but with talking about land back, let's get started. Skylar, I'm gonna go with you for the first question. Simple, what is land back? Can you tell us more about 1492 land back lane? And yeah, give us kind of the lowdown where this all started. <laughs> Actually, I guess it didn't start, but here, but. We're, yeah, we're getting up on almost two years now. July 19th this year will be, will be two years. And, uh, you know, it started quite humbly, actually. Like, there was maybe 20 of us, friends, family, um, that, yeah, we were just, like, uh, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And we had wanted to, to, there was this development that was happening right on the, right on the borders of our reserve and directly across the road from the 2006 reclamation. And there was quite a few of us that took exception to the fact that they were building right across the road from you know a place where so many of us had sacrificed myself i you know sat seven months in jail and you know four months of that in solitary confinement like it was it, it was quite the time for for many people including myself that uh, you know fought to defend that land and make sure that you know that these land would stay pristine that way or at least as pristine as as you know southern ontario gets anyway and uh, yeah, and then after a couple of weeks of being there, uh, the developer there, Fox State Developments, they yeah, were they managed to get a an injunction. Uh, injunction is a bit of paper from a civil court 
uh, without any notice from us to us or uh, any consultation with us or uh, uh, any word of any kind to any of us on the ground. And they got about 120 uh, OPP officers to come and raid the site and arrest uh, nine people, including myself. And uh, uh, they let us out from the police station about four hours later. And for those of us that were in jail, and I can only speak to what happened when I got out, because you know when I got out, there was you know roadblocks set up, there was there was fires, there was there like uh, it, it was it was quite the scene. Uh, kind of returning returning back after four hours of being in jail, I, I it was it was one of those things. You know, a lot has changed in the last four hours of me sitting in this concrete box in this concrete box, and so. I'm like, okay, all right, we're doing a thing now. And so I think that was kind of the moment. That was August 5th. And then, you know, roadblocks got set up. And then after a month of them being up, they finally came down. And then October 22nd happened. And the cops showed up again. And this time people were hit with rubber bullets and taser and uh, many attempts at arrests. But, uh, Lucky on that day, nobody was arrested, and uh, uh, all the melee had sued afterwards. And uh, that morning, the next morning, I woke up. There's a picture that I'm quite fond of, and it's uh, me and Courtney sitting in my car, trying to figure out what we were going to say that morning when the reporters came to ask about uh, all the roads that were dug up and the railways that were dug up and uh, all the, the new borders that were put around the camp to, you know, to keep us safe and, uh, you know, to prevent any more, uh, 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 any more violence from, from landing. It was like, people need to understand it's been Kumbaya by the fire for almost two years now, except of course, for the days that the OPP show up, you know, anytime that, Anytime that somebody shows up with a gun on their hip and a badge on their chest, it, it generally does not make the situation better. And so it's certainly when we're dealing with indigenous folks who've had a long and storied history with uh, law enforcement in their area. And so it's, uh, it, it, it definitely hit home for a lot of us, the, the level of violence, the level of, you know, I think we just had the uh, freedom of information request from uh, APTN or CBC, one of them, uh, a big report on the twenty-one million dollars that was spent policing land back lane from July nineteenth to July nineteenth, and you know it is disgusting numbers like that that are just you know are mind blowing. So that, in a nutshell, is land back lane. Twenty. So right now we are building. And grow like there's gardens, there's there's houses, there's like tiny homes and lots of and people and kids and and yeah and so there's like that stuff is happening right now on site and so it it isn't something that is over and done with. It is something that is ongoing. Twenty one point six million dollars. Twenty one point six That's a significant chunk of change. The, the part that I really like is the fact that uh, of that $21 million, uh, like, I think it was $6 million was spent on salary and $12 million on overtime salary. Mm -hmm. Basically being paid double time to sit there mm -hmm. <laughs> and build gardens. Can we indigenous bodies as they always do? And most of us that have seen this $21 million in action and that $12 million in overtime that was spent. Like, mm -hmm. these were cops that had absolutely no idea what was going on down there. And I, 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 I it is mm -hmm. a ridiculous thought that you can put these people with guns that can affect the lives of, you know, our nations that, you know, like, the, the, these are the people that have absolutely no idea what's happening. None. Mm -hmm. And put them in charge of something. You know, like, it's a scary thought. So I'm going to hop into my next question because it kind of goes into this conversation and I'm going to skip to a different one with Courtney. Because I think 
we have to come to the root of these problems, right? Lambach, Mackenzie Meadows was sold by who? Our band council. And so I think there's really a lot of nuances when it comes to uh, governance within our community. And so I would really like Courtney, if you can maybe explain, give the lowdown on Six Nations governance, elected council, traditional hereditary chiefs. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like that would help. And um, how does engaging with traditional governance support anti-colonial action and land back? I mean, at the root of everything, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have a really complex government structure in our community. It's really, um, it's really tough because it's really unique to us as Haudenosaunee people. So um, fun fact, Layla, Skylar, and I are all Mohawk. We're all from one nation, but we're not from the same family. Uh, and so we are part of, you know, we're clans that make up this nation. And so we are, you know, we're, we're one part of this confederacy of nations. And so this goes back and back to like how our nations originally formed and came and joined each other. And it was through, um, you know, revelation and through like, um, you know, connection to spiritual leaders and all these kinds of like telling about how we can restore and, um, you know, our communities can, our nations could be tied to one another in, in solidarity and solidarity and uphold our sovereignty and, uh, you know, ensure safety and, and all kinds of things for one another. And that set down a, a clan structure about how we're relating to one another, uh, a matriarchal structure that's existed for generations, um, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of years, Haudenosaunee people have operated under this clan structure up until um, 1924. And so through, um, you know, some of the research that's happened at 1492 Lambeck Lane, um, you know, we really got to understand the very specific history of this particular parcel of land, right? It's the Oneida Township. And so, uh, you know, throughout, um, you know, Haudenosaunee people being displaced, um, through the Mohawk Nation traveling through and being allied to the crown, you know, in um, the American Revolution as, you know, Britain and US were fighting over um, whether or not it used to become a country, the Haudenosaunee were involved as, and Mohawks were involved as allies to the crown. And because we were allies to the British crown, um, following the American Revolution, um, we were displaced from our homelands. Um, you know, when US established themselves as a, as a country, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence. Following that, there was something called the Sullivan Campaign, and George Washington ordered uh, 5,000 troops to march on the Haudenosaunee homelands uh, through the Mohawk Valley, and uh, Mohawk people were displaced from the Mohawk Valley and uh, actually ended up living at a fort as um, in uh, this, you know, more northern part of our territory um, as refugees. And that's when the Haldeman Proclamation and, and this idea that the Haudenosaunee would then settle along the Grand River on six miles on either side uh, came to be. And so we were placed as kind of displaced refugees who kind of lost our homes or our, where we were living at the time. And, and we settled along this river and kind of were pushed all along there as well. You know, there were many different peoples that settled up and down along the river and we were condensed. You know, they kept pushing us, pushing us into small, a smaller area so that our lands could be used without our consent or, and developed without our permission. You know, there was, um, there were squatters in the area, and one of those uh, families, uh, you know, one of those squatters uh, made some minor improvements, uh, ended up selling the property to the Nichols family. Skyler can correct me on some of these details. He knows them too, but ended up selling it to the Nichols family, and the Nichols family had um, held it in their family and passed it down from this original disputed deed for uh, probably about 100, 150 years. And then in, in 2005-ish, early 2000s, they, 2003, yeah, they decided they wanted to sell it and they sold it for, to, for development. And they went through a process of trying to get consent from the community and were told no. Uh, they were told no through a public process. The community said they didn't want to see this development happen. There was not going to be consent under, over any ways uh, for this um, for this uh, project. And so uh, comes back around again in... Uh, the 2010s, and they ask again. This time they say, well, we know given the legislation that Indigenous people don't actually have the right to say no to consent under Canadian law, so you can either take it or not, um, which was around $300,000. So they said, told the bank council, you can either take it or not, 
We're developing whether you like it or not. There's nothing in your processes that can stop us from developing this land. So we're going to go ahead with the project, even though your community says no. And um, basically that's it. And so the bank council in that position said, well, you know, a peanut is better than no peanut. Let, well, we're gonna take it because we can do something with this little bit of money. Um, and kind of just said there, there is nothing that they can do given their um, political structure in the community. And so that's where things become uh, contentious, right? Because I talked about that nation, that clan, that structure that we had that we were born into. And that is an inherent government structure that still exists in our community today even though it's been displaced by an elected council system. And so, um, you know, we talked about how we were being displaced by land. You know, there's many different ways that we were oppressed historically. One of them is um, by the theft of our trust funds. So when we were, um, you know, in this refugee kind of state as people who had been uh, decimated by war and disease in our territories, um, the Crown said, you know, you are, in, you as Indians, you can't, um, you know, the banks in Britain won't want to deal with you. The banks won't want to hold your money, so we'll hold it for you. And the King will assign trustees, and we'll oversee your funds uh, for us. And so the Haudenosaunee back in around the early 1800s, around the 1820s, had about 12 million pounds which is a pretty significant amount of money. And um, the King's trustees over time as Canada was appointed ended up depleting the funds. And so this Indian trust was depleted and it was used to do things like build Osgood Hall Law School or uh, offset the costs of the operation of the province of Ontario or um, build a uh, plank road, which is the direct line between uh, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie that uh, cuts through our community. Uh, and so that separates uh, Gunnestado from 1492 Lambac Lane. And so that, uh, you know, all these projects, and there's, and there's no record of the Crown ever um, repaying any of these loans that they pay, gave themselves from our money. And so uh, the Confederacy, the chiefs, the hereditary leaders knew that this money was being misspent. They knew they were being abused. They knew that, the, that they didn't have access to their funds. And so they had pleaded to the king and said, um, you know, we want to have access to our money. We think your trustees are uh, stealing from us. They're giving themselves loans. They're building their own houses with their, our money. And so um, they had eventually petitioned the king enough and built allies that uh, the, the crown agreed to have a royal commission on uh, the misspending of the Indian trust. Uh, that was in 1920. And before the Royal Commission could begin, uh, the RCMP came to our community, uh, arrested uh, our hereditary leaders, uh, took our wampum and our sacred items from our community and instilled an, an elected bank council system that's still in place today. And that elected uh, bank council system, uh, when it was first elected, um, had uh, 38 votes in a community of 3000. And so there was the people that ran essentially and their family members, <laughs> not even all their family members, some of their family members, but there was, um, you know, there was a chief and 12 counselors. So there was 13 positions up for grabs and then 38 people voted in the election. So you would assume that those same people were voting for themselves. And so it was a very small part of our community that was um, willing to uh, take back this system and, um, you know, operationalize it for the crown under the Indian Act. And so that's kind of the system that's been in place in our community uh, since then. You know, um, my cousin, uh, Rick Montour, who's an academic, he's a historian who works at the University of McMaster. He said, you know, they, they did that. They arrested the chiefs and, you know, less than a year later, I think it was about four months later, they had the election and, and they instilled their government. And then shortly thereafter, you know, they released the chiefs and the chiefs went back to the community and, and they went back to meeting. And so even though there was that brief disruption of, you know, kind of less than a year, a few months, uh, the Confederacy's kind of always met. It's always been there. It's always existed in our community, in our territories. And so that system creates this um, conflict in our community. And so we have these two systems, one that is our inherent right, our inherent government structure that has been systematically dispossessed, that residential schools have disrupted um, you know, our connection to it, you see 
um, the federal government maintaining like an Indian status card system that directly disrupts our matrilineal line. It forces people into a patriarchal descent system. And then you have um, uh, another system, an elected system that is entirely uh, supported by the state, entirely systemically empowered. And so you have that system, which is not our inherent government structure saying they're our government, but are actually like a product of federal legislation. Um, and they are then put side by side and our community is expected to say, well, here's the two, these are the two sides of your community, balance them, figure out what you want from them, figure out how these two people are going to play together and how they're going to govern your structure. And even within that compromise, you can see there's that inherent imbalance where how can you expect these two systems to agree when they're so contradictory and one is so empowered and not. And so that is just, you know, what we've been dealing with for the past kind of hundred years and how our community is disrupted. And so I'm so thankful for like people like Skylar who like in this kind of turmoil of like, you know, how this sheds our community of just reminding everyone how important the land is about how important it is to be focused and, and understand that that disruption and division is a product of colonialism. It's a harm that is imposed on our community and that we can overcome it and do the work kind of like what Layla has done around rediscovering ourselves, reinvigorating ourselves, reinvesting in our traditional government systems and structures to overcome that kind of systemic dispossession. And so there are all these kind of um, you know, agitators and uh, people who are probably on CSIS watch lists and, <laughs> and uh, all kinds of different things who are doing this work in our community to organize and try to invigorate and live these traditional government systems and structures and, and keep investing into the, you know, our, our clan system and our matriarchal systems to, uh, to keep them alive. Yeah, I'll go Courtney. That was absolutely well done. It was more than I could have expected it. And I hope this provided the audience with an understanding, a critical lens towards the issues that are of autonomy and governance that are going on in our community and, and why people like Skylar, Layla and Courtney have to go on the front lines to defend our lands and our territories because this is the only option. And so I mentioned my research earlier and I just want you to kind of think with Layla's documentary and what Courtney was talking about, how is autonomy, self-determination, health and environments all connected together right we can see this interconnection our communities can feel it and we need to start to acknowledge that within these certain spaces and so and i think it's also it's it's important for us to recognize that this is not just a, a hold mishoni issue this is not just a six nation issue uh you know this is this is the, the root of the issues in uh in west Sudan right now uh where you know, hereditary chiefs who have been title holders and stewards of that land since time immemorial uh, have, you know, made this conscious decision, this law in their in their own ceremonies and their feast hall, in accordance with their traditional law that pipeline, no pipeline will pass through their territory. Uh, and because of band council systems working with pipelines, working with industry, uh, you know, signing deals uh, without the consent, without the uh, the approvals of hereditary chiefs, uh, you cause this conflict. And so, you know, as, as we were standing there, uh, you know, on the, on the front line, uh, you know, hundreds of RCMP uh, attack dogs, uh, you know, assault rifles pointed at you with fingers on the trigger. Like I've never had a gun pointed at me in my life. Uh, and so that feeling of, you know, this, this colonial violence, this oppression, that was sent by the government to remove us from that land, remove these hereditary chiefs and and, and their decision over that land, uh, you know, it was really brought to the forefront. And, you know, there's this moment when you have to decide in your life, uh, you know, whose, whose laws uh, do I live by? And for me, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a no brainer standing in the, on that bridge with, you know, the, the, the elders and, and the, the, the tribe members of that land, uh, you know, it's like, no, this is, this is their land and they say no, uh, and they have a voice and it matters. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that is, you see it in, ev in every, uh, you know, uh, coast to coast on Turtle Island.
Layla, you read my mind, you got right into it. And so I'm going to continue to follow up with that, right? We have these camps on Six Nations, but there's so many other people also resisting across Turtle Island. And so why is it important to build solidarity across camps and movements and, and how are relationships at the core of these conversations? I think uh, I would really, uh, so I've, I've got Skylar here with me and uh, it's easier if I just pass in my phone, uh, <laughs> but I really think that he should answer this question as, you know, he has been an advocate for solidarity for, uh, you know, across tribal lines, across nation to nation, uh, and that impact has, has been very meaningful and significant to the movement. And so, yeah, like the part of that is building that solidarity. And so having those conversations with all those nations that are, you know, part of that resistance. And so when you see hereditary councils, and for us, we have a little bit more with the Wet'suwet'en because of, you know, our our hereditary chiefs here in Six Nations said that, you know, they would stand behind them and back them up in whatever way they could. And so, you know, that has some obligation for us to, to, to go and to, to stand shoulder to shoulder, to, to to amplify, to do whatever it is that we can in order to, to, to help. And so like uh, when it comes to building that solidarity between these movements, like there's so much that Indigenous communities and Indigenous nations across the country have gone through. They like residential schools, over incarceration rates, the child protective system that like you name it, the list just keeps going on and on and on. And so the level of trauma, the level of dispossession, the, 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 the amount of hate and racism that we've all had to deal with uh, means that there are very few of us in, in a place where we can say, you know what, we're going to go and put ourselves on the front line. We're willing to, to, to risk jail. We're willing to risk those, those assault rifles that Leo was just talking about, that they are very real assault rifles that are pointed at you with their attack dogs and, you know, all of the, uh, uh, all of the money obviously the $21 million that was just spent on little old, little old us here at Six Nations, you know, camped out in a, camped out in a field. And so like, it's uh, like those, those moments of solidarity, whether you're talking like on October 22nd, when, you know, we see thousands of people out to, to land back lane or, you know, on August 5th in, in, in the aftermath of the, of the raid, like there were, there were people that came here from everywhere and i mean everywhere in the middle of a pandemic to, to, whether that was just to sit in their car because again it was a pandemic and so people would just come and sit in their car and come and say hi and say you know what uh, we just came from edmonton we just came from toronto we just came from halifax we just came from you know like all the way like and, and you know you, i can't even remember all of the places that people were from but like that's what it takes to make real wins possible you know, like those, those wins for us are so few and far between that, like, when, you know, I, I gotta say, when Mohawks put our foot down, you know, it, like, whether you're talking about at, at, at Oka or, or Abutaste or Benawage and Tainanega and uh, here in Six Nations over and over and over again, you know, like, it, it, it's something that, you know, when we, when we say no, like, it, it, it's time to hit then to start eating that noise. And I think those wins, like, you know, when you think about those wins, they, they're, they're not the traditional wins. Like we didn't change the laws. We haven't, uh, you know, beat our court case yet. Uh, we, uh, we haven't had the charges dropped uh, and the actual level of uh, criminalization, uh, the, the level of expense uh, that, you know, the, the state is willing to go to, uh, to, to ensure that these movements, to ensure that our voices are silenced. Uh, you know, I, I felt that when I, when I came home after, uh, after being arrested in Wet'suwet'en, you know, there was, uh, we were at a rally and I saw, you know, police cherries in the, in, in the rear view. And as soon as I saw them, I had this moment of, you know, paralysis. Uh, you know, I didn't want to speak. I didn't, I didn't want to, I, you know, I, I just felt frozen and, you know, I'm sitting there in the car and I, it hit me in that moment that, that, that was the, that was the intent. That was why uh, they didn't want me to come home and continue to speak up. They didn't want me to come home and continue to use my voice. Uh, they wanted to traumatize me into fear, 
to uh, to resist. And the fact that you know Indigenous people keep standing up even in this face of of fear and trauma, uh, the, the resistance is you know just a, a a true sign of our you know our strength and, and it's what sets us apart. And that, like you said, there's you know once when we say no, uh, there's 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 something that that's significant there. So that win. Uh, you know, even though we're still going through criminal charges, they're still uh, you, using the full intent, extent of the law to, uh, to criminalize us for standing on that bridge. Uh, you know, the win comes from that act of resistance, that, that act of saying no. Uh, and, uh, you know, that simple act can spark, can, you know, have these, these ripple, these snowball effects that we can say no, and our voices must be heard. They must be respected. Uh, and we will continue to say no as long as we have to. You both have just encapsulated so much and you already answered the next question. So I'm just going to throw it out there for both of you to answer if you want. But, but just around like these spaces, front lines, why are they necessary to our movements, to our sovereignty as Indigenous nations, which you've already encapsulated so much of it. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I, I know that for my personal experience, when uh, you know, when I when I went to with student and I saw this, you know, this this small community of land defenders, uh, you know, living in a camp uh, with barely any anything like, uh, you know, or sleeping in this tiny little trailer in, in minus 40 degree weather, uh, you know, ice just on <laughs> ice on the floor, literally <laughs> ice on the floor, uh, you know, and, and but everybody worked together. It was like it was the first time I had seen with my own eyes this idea of a village, of everyone has a role, everyone has a responsibility, everyone works together and supports each other for this common mission, whether they were Asian or white or indigenous or not indigenous or Mohawk or, uh, you know, Wet'suwet'en or wherever they were from, there was this, this, uh, th this community. And I know when I was out there, it made me think really long and hard uh, about, you know, my my things at home, because I was in this moment of, you know, being in this community, this village, this, this unity, this solidarity, uh, and, you know, none of that other stuff that we worry about, all of those things that we have, uh, you know, they didn't matter. And I was at this happiest moment, you know, that I, that I can remember being other than, you know, being raided, but before then, uh, you know, like being in this state of joy and not having anything but, you know, two pairs of pants on me. Uh, and so thinking, you know, like this is a reminder of how, uh, you know, how our, our ancestors lived, how they meant, how we were meant to live is, you know, not with this, this uh, consumerist mindset of, of obtaining stuff and acquiring wealth and, uh, you know, building up, uh, you know, economies, uh, but actually sustaining and surviving with each other and thriving uh, in that, in that village mentality. So that, that was a big lesson for me. Uh, and I know that Skylar's been on many a front lines and seen many different, uh, you know, acts of solidarity and, and experienced many of these uh, moments and places. So I'll, I'll let him answer the question as well. So just so people know, like, I've been very, very lucky in my life that I've had, you know, amazing, amazing, smart people around me to, to you know, give me these words of wisdom. And one of those people, yeah, is Courtney. And so uh, I remember talking about, uh, I got a question one time about what does land back mean? And beyond the, like the very literal, give us our, give us our goddamn land back. <laughs> uh, and so, and we started talking about it and, and like coming to like, because anytime you do this, it's putting up this, huge billboard it's putting up this you know neon sign of saying you know come welcome home and you see these people that come from all over the place that say you know and we've and i've heard this story over and over and over again of people coming back to the community and being like you know my mom was from six nations but she never lived here she was taken away to residential school and you know and, on, and like all of those stories of people coming home and so like when I first seen uh, Layla's film and, you know, and, and talked to her about it, I was like, well, that's exactly what we're talking about. Like that invitation is exactly what land back is. And so in order to be able to say, you know, come home, welcome, welcome those brothers
brothers and sisters that were stolen from our communities, from our nations. Like, like that, that, that bit of, that bit of love, that bit of trust, that bit of unity that is, you know, like is expressed when we put up those, you know, and as funny as it may sound, when we put up those barricades, that is a huge welcome mat to all of those folks that have been pushed away from our community, stolen from our community, kidnapped even. And so like, if, if what we're doing is talking about reconciliation, if what we're doing is talking about being able to uh, uh, reinvigorate some of those, some of that culture and, and, and that community, that sense of community around bringing our people together, like that's what it's about. It's being able to say to somebody like Layla that has been, you know, her, her family has been pushed away from our community or, or walked away from our community out of fear or uh, whatever. And so like that code of shame that she was talking about, like those are the things that we are looking to strip away with the land that by saying, you know, we need to be able to say to everybody, welcome home, come home, but we need to be able to have land to do that. And so when we talk about those things, like we talked about seeing Hamilton or Toronto or Niagara Falls or Brantford Kitchener, all of these communities, all of these cities around us that have just grown over and over and over and over again. Like they've, they've grown exponentially over the last 150 years. But for us, we've seen our communities, and this isn't just Six Nations, this is across the board, that we've seen our communities shrink over and over and over again. And so we've got a booming population. And Courtney was right on the money with, you know, the, those 38 people that voted in that first election. You know what? Those numbers don't translate very much different in, in today. The last voter turnout that we had for uh, the elected office was 4%. That was a significant increase from the year before is 3.2%, which the band council was very happy about. But this is the, type, this is the level of engagement with the state process that, like for me, my family would, would, you know, like there would be a significant shunning that would happen if I voted in their system. Because that is a system that is, you know, robbed my parents, my grandparents of, you know, of the life and freedom that, you know, their grandparents and great grandparents fought for to make sure that they had. So who am I to not fight for that? You know, who, who are you to not stand behind those agreements that, your government has made with our nation, you know, 200 years ago, that our people, you know, bled for, sweated for, you know, died for, to be able to, uh, to have this country be the country that it is. So, hope that hits, hits well, some of the things there. Both of you, I hope everyone felt the love because there is a lot of stigmatization. You guys are literally called terrorists. And like, do you think we <laughs> Like, look at that love. Look at the passion <laughs> behind that. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, it make, front lines are necessary. We need them to be sovereign. But I also want to remind you of what Layla said and that you don't necessarily need to be on the front lines to lamb back, to water back. You, everyone has a role within these conversations, right? And so I wanted to actually kind of shift the conversation to see where the lamb back conversation in Six Nations has gone now with Protect the Track, why we're mm -hmm. all here. And so Courtney, mm -hmm. Yeah. Protect the track. What is protect the track? How did you get to this place? And what are you currently doing? And what is the vision? Like, what, what are you radically reimagining Six Nations? What are you thinking? Yeah. So um, protect the track is really important because it builds off of um, a moratorium on development that was announced by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council back in April of uh, 2021. And so you know, with this land to see what's going on. And one of the things that was happening in these conversations we were having in community was there were so many people that were acknowledging that 1492 Land Back Lane is primarily people of my generation, you know, people who were teens when 2006 Douglas Creek Estate happened. You know, these are our aunts and uncles, these are our parents, our grandparents who are a part of this first kind of like really radical, um, you know, um, movement that happened in our community in 2006 and we heard a lot of them saying you know we did that we took that stand so that you wouldn't have to and there was this kind of feeling in our community of almost like a, a guilt that there hadn't been you know that this 15 years of lack of progress 
when the province walked away from negotiating with our community, that we were somehow responsible for that. That the Crown's failure to negotiate and you know uphold the honor of the Crown, that we were somehow responsible for that. And so there's been a really, there was a really kind of interesting cross-generational conversation that we had where you know, we as younger people, I think, looked at those aunts and uncles and said, you taught us how to do this. You taught us to love our land. You taught us to stand up. You taught us to use our voices. And I remember seeing like a, one of those Facebook memes where like, in the time of dragons, don't be ashamed of raising, raising dragon slayers. And that's kind of like what hit me about our, you know, the activism of young Indigenous people was, you know, we do have this um, resistance, but our leaders and our traditional leaders said, and our, a lot of the parents were saying, we don't want our kids to have to keep putting their bodies on the line. You know, and there was a, there was a part of our community that was, you know, um, Skylar was talking about this around how like, you know, our brothers, people on the front line at Six Nations, you know, they were shot with rubber bullets. There were police tasers that were being shot um, and rubber bullets at traditional leaders um, that were sitting on a fire. Like it's very dangerous when for our communities when um, people want to maintain control over the land they've stolen for us from us. And so there was this thought of like, well, how do we shift this conversation? Let's engage another strategy around it because even though we know we're willing to be on the front lines, um, our leadership wanted to do what they could do around like, you know, making sure we don't have to keep putting our bodies on the line. And so the Confederacy and the elected council kind of came to this agreement that there should be a moratorium on development in the Haldeman track. And they said they don't want any more developments happening. Um, you know, they announced it and there was a really strong um, push from this conversation being led by the people on the ground at 1492 and then people in the community who were involved in, in trying to come up with um, solutions to the roads being closed and things like that. And so it was something that folks on the ground and in the community actually wrote and brought to the leaders and said, here's what we think might work. This is a new tactic and a new strategy. And so once the moratorium was launched, it was like, well, how do you actually enforce the moratorium? What does the moratorium mean now? And how do we, you know, mobilize it? How do we talk about the moratorium? How do we talk about, you know, this connection that we have to the Grand River, you know, the six miles on either side that um, we're talking about as being stolen from us, like, what does that mean? And so um, it kind of just grew out of that. It grew out of those conversations, you know, conversations we were having with Skylar, um, you know, another one of our buddies, his name's Todd Williams. He's critical to all of this work. Other people in the community, I see other volunteers that we have too, um, that are here too, and I acknowledge them and all their hard work. But it was just kind of like, you know, we, we have to drive this conversation in another way. So we talked about uh, we developed this campaign called Protect the Tract. And so it basically just started with like, you know, social media and an Instagram account and saying, we want this moratorium to be taken seriously. And so myself as a volunteer and community people were really said that, you know, what can we do to protect the tract? How can we invigorate land stewardship? How do we transmit this knowledge? You know, what, and I, and I think about this and I really challenge myself and our, our team to think about um, you know, what does it mean for Protect the Track to be real, like that land stewardship? And there are these parts of our speeches, these old speeches and this old kind of foundational law of the Haudenosaunee when we talk about, you know, our original instructions of this relationship to the land that we have, but this relationship to coming faces. And we talk about these future generations of Haudenosaunee children. And the things that we know, the laws that we have, the sustenance that we enjoy and the waters that we're using, we are borrowing that from our future generations and we borrow that from our children and our ability to, to transmit that to them is a sacred inheritance. You know, we enjoy that now because the generations behind us made that sacrifice for us. We are those children that were sacrifices were made for. And that, that sacred relationship that we have from our grandparents to transmit it to our grandchildren, that's something that no one can interfere with. That is our right as people, as distinct nations. That's what builds our communities and what sustains us. And so Protect the Track is really about like, how do we keep protecting our right to share our knowledge with our children, to have them have clean water, to have them have a home, 
and having our community and having the people that live along the track with us in these areas within our traditional territory involved in that conversation knowing that this is not a confrontational conversation you know we don't want to keep having this settler indigenous relationship that's happening at the barrel of the gun with OPP. We are as these people who are in this defensive position, defending our land, saying, here's another opportunity or extending a hand to you to have a peaceful conversation about what's gonna happen with the land along the Haldeman Tract. What's gonna happen now with these conversations? And so that is what Protect the Tract is doing. You know, we're slowly building, we're building our capacity. We're thinking about, you know, our long-term growth, doing things, you know, for the community, but also outside of a territory and doing that work for our own healing, our own mindset to say like, we can think of our territories beyond the reserve boundaries. Our territory extends beyond this postage stamp that we are placed on. If our community is going to grow, we need to have that space to welcome people home. Like Skylar was saying, missing and murdered women, when they're found, where are they going to go? If our shelters are full, if we don't have anywhere to build houses, where are the children of residential school survivors going to come home to if they do that? You know, how are we going to feed our people when George Washington and Sullivan burned down our orchards and destroyed our food stores? How are we going to feed our people if we don't have orchards, if we don't have those food stores, if we don't grow corn for them? You know, we, we have these practices that we need to reinvigorate within our own communities. And so Protect the Track plays a small role under the jurisdiction of our traditional government to do that public education. And so we've tried very, very diligently and have worked over, you know, the past two years to be really disciplined in our thinking to say, we don't need colonial uh, definitions or validations to do work. We can be uh, completely under our traditional government. We can operate within these systems. We can reinvigorate them. We can create our own way of doing things, of organizing, of doing public events, of being on Zoom, of doing public education, um, and also be grounded in our clan system, grounded in our processes, grounded in our government structures. And it can, that's what makes it real. And I think people have this image of indigenous life or indigenous law being something that's pre-contact. But I think what Protect the Track does, it makes it contemporary. You know, we can show how we use new technology. We can be a people that are still grounded in a law that belongs to us and that belongs to future generations of Haudenosaunee children. And we're thinking of them when we do things um, in our territory, when we use our lands and when we steward our lands well, with them in mind beautiful and and you perfectly leeway into the next last question which every single one of you touched on it so I'm going to open it up for everyone to answer I'll start with Layla first though um, because the documentary encapsulates this idea and, and I don't know you can see like the Instagram there's like a little sticker with like lamb back water back everything back or like the quote you see lamb back water back culture back we were doing graffiti at the blockade and we were like everything back like chief back <laughs> ceremony back and so we've been hearing a lot of this quote of everything is interconnected and and so with that being said how is land defense and water protection interconnected to our sovereignty cultural resurgence coming back into our identities as Ungwe Hue peoples because it's so much more than just getting the land back just getting the waters back it means it means getting ourselves back, right? And so I would love to hear you guys finish off this beautiful, like well done panel, uh, focusing on these ideas that have been talked about throughout the whole conversation. Well, I think that, you know, the, the land back, the water back, uh, this is not, you know, and, and it's interesting because it's, it's not a, just an indigenous issue, this disconnection from land and water. Uh, you know, I, I speak to so many non-Indigenous organizations and communities and, uh, you know, schools and, uh, you know, they, we have become so disconnected from our water, like, thought without even any sort of honoring or acknowledging to how that water sustains you. Uh, we see it as a commodity um, and, you know, at the a chemical compound of H2O and you know that's what I was taught when I was in school is that that's what water is it's it's hydrogen and oxygen um 
when I started to understand that it was, it was a living entity and it, you know, the land, the water, these are not just things that exist, but they are alive. And when you take on that relationship with the land and water and it becomes it becomes uh, a relative to you. It becomes, you know, part of your family. Uh, it is alive to you. It is a friend to you. It knows you. It hears you. It speaks to you. It listens to you. And uh, you're like, okay, for example, if you saw your mother being raped and brutalized and abused and destroyed, you what would you do? You would. You would defend her. You would stand up. Uh, so when you see the waters being destroyed, you see, you know, the fact that we have become so disconnected. We don't even know what happens to our water when it goes down the drain. We don't even know where it came from and the process. Is. We're just putting that in the hands of you know, our governments that they're gonna, they're going to take care of the water. Of course, they're taking care of it. Of course, they're protecting it. Uh, you know, and we have to take back that responsibility so that it's not, you know, the water is a commodity. It's my brother. And so, you know, my brother is under threat. My brother is under siege. And for that brother, I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for the, the relationship that I have uh, with the land and water. So that's that's my two cents. I'll pass it over <laughs> to the driver's side. Um, yeah, I, you know what? And I think Lila really hit, hit on a little bit with the, the talking about the connection stuff. You know, and like, that idea that we are connected to the land, that we are connected to the water, that we are connected to each other. Like those, those, those are the things that they tried to beat out of us in residential school. Those are the things that they tried to over incarcerate out of us. You know, like this is what they're trying to do with child protective services stuff, trying to steal children from our community still today. You know, like this is that 250 year old song and dance that all of us have, you know, we know, we know the tune now. You know, and so like for us to be able to make these stands and you know make those stands together and honor those connections, because like that's what it takes. You know, it's it's that ability to be able to, to really feel and understand what that means to be connected. Like you know that 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 part of of us. You know, like we are we are made from like you know we talk about our creation story. Like we are made from this earth. You know, and I, it, it's really funny actually. Just in saying that, um, two years ago at Land Back Lane, uh, for people that had gone there, like it was the desert, like every blade of grass, every shrub, every tree had been bulldozed over, and all that was left was this bare clay. And, and so hot, it was so so hot. You just sweat, and this mud, this clay would stick to you just these rivers of like muddy clay dripping down yeah it was just it, too many days without showers <laughs> and um, and yeah and it just it really was like you know like it, like this is like this is the clay that we're made from it made it made it a very real metaphor for you to be like like this is like this is who we are this is this, this is how important this is it's, it, like to feel all of it and Trust me, it is part of my blood in every bit of me now. <laughs> so there is no breaking that connection. Like you can't rubber bullet that out of me. You can't taser it. You can't jail and you know, like injunctions and all the rest of it. Don't hold a don't hold water to that connection that we have. So thank you so much, Serena and Brittany and Layla. It's like I'm honored and humbled to be able to sharing these conversations with you guys and so I love you guys so much. Oh you, you that clay story could make me cry sitting here. <laughs> make me cry listening to you. And <laughs> H2O like it is so much more to that. And and when we think like even terms like contamination or like like that is not how we think. We think like how can I help you? what is wrong? Like, what can we do, right? It's our relationships. And so, Courtney, are you wanting to add something? I feel like you might have something to say around our laws as Haudenosaunee and how that is also, like, within the governance structure itself is all interconnected. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I was just thinking about that, about how we like build this interdependence in, right? We build this like, um, that healing is across families. And we have like these, this concept of like sides, right? In our, our nation where some nations are on one side and others are another one. And you, you can only heal when that other family comes to, to support you, to, to bring that healing towards you. And we have this kind of uh, structural interdependence in our in our confederacy between our clans and our family and I think that that's those are the kind of values that are critical to these ideas of like treaties you know Layla I was just thinking about like you know how Layla had talked about like the Turo wampum right and we talk about this idea of like non-interference between Haudenosaunee and non-Haudenosaunee people and that's really important but there's this relationship that exists there you know there's this there's a structure about how we're supposed to relate to one another. And so it was never about like, you know, there was this, there was just this, there's this always a, you know, this connection to that relationship about how everything's relational and how our instructions said about how we're supposed to be kind and caring and have this idea of stewardship, this relationship to the land. And I think that that's really important too, because we, you know, we haven't really touched on maybe like that law, but it talks about how we are acting as kind of like um, stewards of the land, but also how we care for one another as human beings and how we care for creation. And that comes into kind of how the compassion that I think, especially the people like Skylar role model around, just helping everyone build their capacity to be stronger allies and to support one another and to show up on front lines or to, donate or do whatever kind of skill you have to do any of that kind of work and to just start where you are and build from that. And I think that's been one of the really cool things that I've seen is, you know, um, when I was, in, you know, in 06, I went, I was in high school and there was so much racism that happened. And there was people that were in these towns that, um, that realize that they kind of could see that and they they too sat alongside us for like 15 years of nothing happening and they have they it kind of built in this empathy with these people of saying we understand that frustration now because we've sat and endured that same frustration you know we were expecting our government to act but they never did anything and so there does need to be a change in the script so people that like never came to anything in 06 suddenly showed up at Lambac Lane and were like I'm here now you know I didn't know then but I know now so I brought I brought some coffee, and then those people transformed into um, bringing food every week. And they've been in there as long as we have, for like every you know every Tuesday or every Sunday for over the past year, just showing up and bringing food and just doing whatever they can, right? And it's like, and it's like all of a sudden they're just like as deeply invested into this like push for liberation that we're in, because they're doing what they can, you know. And it doesn't seem you know, it might not seem all that radical to some people to make a meal and drive it, you know, 20 minutes up the road, but that dedication is just so strong. And then you share meals together over months, like through the seasons, and we build a different type of dynamic in that relationship. And we have just like this strong connection now to people that were just like, you know, I came here and I, I realized that this is a place of transformation where things are different, right? And that when we have these um, these spaces where our communities can control, you know, what we want to see for ourselves, you know, um, I think a lot of the seller people around us have seen, you know, they are, pre they are just building houses, you know, they are just looking for some place to be at peace. They are just building gardens and have garden boxes and you see them lighting off fireworks on birthdays and, you know, or walking their dogs or that kind of thing, right? It's just like, it's just normal things because we've been robbed of that humanity for so long. And these kind of arbitrary lines have been put up to keep our communities apart without building that understanding of that mutual trust and recognition of one another. And so um, I think that's kind of like where I'm sitting with this now, just saying like, you know, we want people to feel empowered, to know that they can learn and they can grow. Their actions can take place wherever they are. You know, especially if people on the Zoom here are thinking like, you know, it's kind of far for, they might live in the, in the tract or outside the tract and they can say like, you know, you can engage with your own local municipality. You can go to your municipality and say, why aren't you upholding these laws? Why aren't you, you know, doing this work on our behalf? You know, we expect our own government to behave honorably. We expect the province, you know, we see the last election and Doug Ford saying he's gonna build a road into the ring of fire. And we see communities in that treaty territory saying, 
we don't want this road, we don't want this to happen. And we see it, uh, we're primed for another round of conflict and land theft and genocide to happen in front of our eyes. And we have a premier who's setting the stage for it already of saying this is something that he's going to accomplish in the next four years. And then we see that and we have to know that, you know, this is the time to organize. We have to keep uh, having action while this injustice is happening. And there has to be people who are willing to do that because I think, you know, um, when the 215, uh, uh, you know, unmarked graves were found in in Kamloops, one of the things that struck me was, you know, I, I know Sukhumic people and I know people in, in the Wet'suwet'en and people in those territories. And I thought like, you know, these aren't just people historically that we lost, you know, these aren't just children that died a hundred years ago or 150 years ago. These are grandparents, these are great grandparents. And you mourn not that not only them as children, but their descendants who would be here today. And you mourn your cousins. You mourn your nieces and nephews who aren't here because their families are gone and their line ended. You know, you mourn those people that could be here and standing beside us on the front lines that aren't there to defend their land and water. And you realize that's the whole point of these historic projects is to steal people from the land so that they can't be there on the front line to defend their territories. There was hundreds of children that were, you know, a hundred, what is it, 10,000 children that were killed, you know, or the, the residential school that's closest to um, Grand River. It's one of the oldest residential schools. It was an operation for over 150 years. Over 100,000 children went to that school. Uh, and you think about what does that mean for our nations that don't have populations that you think they would, because the people who would be on these front lines are gone from our communities. And I think that has been one of the really tough things to take away is just think, thinking like, we do still need that solidarity. We do still need allyship. We need people who are willing to stand alongside us to push forward in whatever way they can to help in that, um, help in that liberation fight. Oh my goodness, now go ahead, Courtney, Layla, Skylar, like absolutely beautiful. This is more than I could have imagined. And I just feel like I'm sitting here, like taking in everything and thinking of like, we talk about the coming faces and this is the type of spaces we need to be able to empower the next generation, right? And so right now we're all in this space of resistance and, and what do you feel? You don't feel grief. No, I feel empowered. I feel love. I feel like we can, we're unstoppable. We're going to get that lamb back. We're going to get that water back, our culture back, our ceremonies, right? Especially when we have mentors and role models, like these three amazing individuals. I'm, I'm 23 years old and I, I came back home because of 1492. I saw what was happening in my community. And, and from there, it's now I, I can never leave. <laughs> it's stuck in you. And it's just something that's mainly in you. And I hope today these three panelists shared that with you. And I hope that stays in you. That little light is now a flame. And, and this is where you can get started. And, and there's so many ways to get involved. And, and so. I just need to, I need to jump in with you on that and say, you know what, that absolute refusal to be defined by those traumas, to be defined by those in over incarceration rates and the child protective services and to be defined by whatever bit of colonial bullshit that they've tried to put on us over the last 200 years. You know what? I fucking refuse to be defined by whatever they got to say about me. Yes. Yes, Skylar. And that is what all of, I hope everyone got out of that from the three panelists today is we refuse. We refuse to give them what they want. We're from the land. We are the land and we're going to take it all back. <laughs> now go to the amazing audience and, and for staying, for staying so long, but like, how could you not stay long? I just wanted to keep listening to them. I could still listen to them all. Um, but this was an amazing panel. It just makes me even think more of like, we need more spaces like this. We need more panels. We need more Mohawks at the forefront, right? These are the <laughs> things we need. So thank you again. And this was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Sweet. Two rivers. Um, are you wrapping up then? Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Thank you for the hosts of this event, Protect the Tract. 
Um, we encourage you folks to, to check out uh, all the other upcoming events happening uh, that the Two Rivers Festival is hosting. I've put some links into the chat for you. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, to all of you for, for joining us today um, and have a good night. Um, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Follow the socials. Protect the track 1492. Goodbye.